Oh, let me plug this in. Volume on or off? Hey, Facebook Live. Franz Borkart here with the Go Roos Show from Talk 107.3 Studios over at Guarantee Broadcasting. We're going to be kicking this thing off in a couple of minutes. We've got a great show lined up today. We've got Ann Milneck from Red Stick Spice Company. We've got Marley Pittman from Mid City Redevelopment. And then our second half, we're going to kick it old school. We're going to have Tommy Talley in the studio talking about just about anything Tommy Talley wants to talk about. You ever hung out with Tommy Talley, Brian? Yes, got to spend some time with Tommy at, uh, in Washington, D.C. earlier this year. For D.C. Mardi Gras? Yeah. What was that like? Uh, that was where I learned that I can't hang with Jay Cody And Tommy, or just Jay? You know, I think the two contributed to each other, so probably both. Uh, just it's, it's, Was it's it a eating, speed I don't drinking? Run yes, yes, and yes. Only difference is those guys didn't have to be up for a morning show. Although, to Jay's credit, he was up with me in the morning, so... Uh, yeah, it, it not not my pace. Fun though, lots of fun. Goodness gracious, goodness gracious, test, 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 there you go. I hear me. You're hearing you? And you know I love me some me. Well, there's that. All right. I'm not going yet. I'm just testing it here. You're good. All right. All right, here we go. Stand by. All right, welcome to another episode of the Go Rouge Radio Show, episode 41. Happy belated Labor Day. Labor Day was this last weekend. You're listening to your host go, to the Go Rouge Show, Franz Borkart. Master Controls is Brian Haldane. Brian, how are you doing? I'm always good. How about I'm you? glad to hear that. I did a laborless Labor Day holiday. It was magnificent. I did no labor. I didn't practice law. I didn't do anything with the Go Roo show. I slouched on the couch, watched a little Amazon, binge watched Cobra Kai, binge watched the first three episodes. I don't know if it's binging if it's the first three episodes um, um, of uh, the boys over on Amazon. So yeah, life's good. So before we jump into our show today, let's thank our sponsors. These are the folks that make the Go Roo show possible. We have the Smith Shanklin Sosa Personal Injury Law Firm. Um, they are your go-to personal injury law firm. Uh, definitely want to call them if you have a personal injury need. Um, Breck Parks, Sullivan Steakhouse, your neighborhood steak restaurant. I think I'm going to get some 
think I'm going to get a burger today from Sullivan's uh, this evening uh, for dinner. Uh, speaking of burgers, we're going to have to talk about the slider competition that's coming up next week, Brian. Also, sponsors, Borkhart Law Firm. That's my little sh- not my little shop, uh, focusing in criminal defense law. If you have a criminal defense need, give us a call. Louisiana Tech Park and La Divina Cafe, Italian Cafe, open every day with your custom-made, from-scratch breakfast. I missed it this morning, um, but you definitely don't want to miss it yourself, so definitely check them them out. So, if you want more information about the Go Rouge show, you want to go to www.gorouge.com, and if you want to drop us a show topic, email us at info at gorouge.com. Without further ado, our first guest for the first segment is Anne from Red Stick Spice Company. Anne, how's it going? Really well. How are you, Ron? Well, I'm 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 good, and partly because of the wonderful things you guys are doing at the Red Stick Spice Company. So, as you know, Anne, and as Brian probably doesn't know, I've been on a hot tea kick. Right? I'm living yeah. the hot tea life. I'm living my best hot tea life. And your employees, you guys, have helped me immerse myself in the hot tea world. Um, you have very helpful staff. They are very unpretentious. In in in, I, look, I walked in. And I admitted I knew nothing about tea. Um, and so now I'm pretty much coming three or four times a week, which is probably it's probably a bit excessive, but you know it is what it is. And and what people don't know is not only can you buy hot tea there, like to, to steep at your house, but y'all will actually steep it for the customer while they are shopping. Um, we, we, we do, yeah. Oh, my God. love you. I love you guys so much. So so what I want to talk to you about, Ann, a little bit about is what is going on at Red Stick Spice Company. I want to talk a little bit about spices for beginners, and I want to talk about tea if we have time. Um, as, I, as I, again, will mention, I'm a tea nut now. So, okay. So you guys are expanding right now, right? We are. We are in the permitting process of our cooking classroom. It's about 2,000 square feet right adjacent to our shop in Mid-City on Jefferson. So we took over that space, and we have been um, renovating for the past six months, and it's looking beautiful, and we should be up and running with cooking classes very soon. Well, you know, I saw the space. I I did a demo um, for Healthy BR not too long ago with my son Fisher. You were you were there, Um, and I got to tell you, I love the old kitchen, and I say old kitchen with love. I mean, it's a good kitchen, your demo kitchen that you currently have, but this new space, wow! I I am expecting good things from you guys. What are you planning to do in that space? So the you know it's funny about the old kitchen. We're kind of in that mode. If you've ever heard stories about uh, chefs who uh, renovate their restaurant but refuse to let anyone touch the kitchen because they're afraid if they change anything, the magic is going to change of what comes out of that kitchen. And we're kind of like nervous because it's like we've done such good things in this little space. And when I say little, I mean tiny with zero built-in appliances, all on portable induction burners. And it's fascinating to me and one little oven one little convection oven and we have turned out class after class three and four and five nights a week of amazing food so we are in that little bit of trepidation of are we still going to be able to do it in this bigger space but the bottom line is that we needed a bigger space we right. so much demand from mainly corporate clients who want to do team building who want to do um, holiday celebrations with their staff and we needed the capacity so we needed to be able to get upwards of 14 16 18 people in the space which is impossible in our right. in our current place, space the it, other reason why the build out needed to happen is i need that current space to open my tea bar that has uh, been oh yes in the works for years so, and we are finally going to do it natural segue I was just about to ask. I hear rumors. I hear rumors about T-Bar. Mm-hmm. What is a T-Bar? What are y'all thinking about doing there? So if you think about what a barista does for you in a coffee shop, it's mm-hmm. going to be the same um, scenario, just with tea, all tea. So you'll be able to get um, a simple pot or cup of hot tea. We'll, of course, have iced tea daily. Um, we'll be doing you know, lattes and then, of course, blended drinks. Um, because everybody's all about those frozen, icy um, coffee drinks. So we'll be doing those same blended drinks with tea. But more than anything, we just wanted to bring approachable tea that isn't fussy to the public. Because what happened to me eight years ago when I bought the shop, 
I'm a I'm a chef, so I understood food and flavor. But I had the only thing I knew about tea was sweet or unsweet. Right. And um, I there was an employee who I who was with the shop, and she stayed on with me, and she had studied at Oxford, and she had a lot of rules around tea, and it was really intimidating. And I was like, you know what? I, I'm tired of watching customers come in for tea and then not leave with tea because right. they're so confused. So I just approached it as I would a food. You know, here's this leaf. How does it respond when I apply hot water or cold water to it? Same thing I would do with a piece of asparagus, whether I boil it or grill it. You know, what happens to it? What happens to the flavor profile? What happens to the sweetness? And I just started studying it as I would food. And I did a lot of online courses. I did a lot of tea training out in California. Um, And, you know, I earned some certifications, which are really cute, hanging on the wall. But the bottom (laughs) line, you know, yeah, I'm a tea sommelier. And people Uh, say, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's tea sommeliers? Yes. Uh, Yes. I'm writing this down right now. Yeah. New life goal for Franzi. (laughs) Tea sommelier. (laughs) So the main thing I wanted to do was be able to talk to customers about this tea and take all confusion and intimidation away. And um, and the bottom line is you can study. There's a Chinese proverb. You can study tea every day of your life. And the day you die, you know nothing. So even though I have those certificates on the wall, I know nothing. So it's important that we are constantly, we cup teas every day in the, in the shop. Employees have unlimited access to drinking tea throughout their shift because that's how you learn it. So you drink it. I live in Mid-City. My son goes to school in Mid-City. Um, I will tell you, Anne, you are just, you just happen to be located in my favorite area because I can go get tea from you guys. I can go to Jed's Po' Boys. I can mm. go to Reginelli's. That entire little area, to me, that is my mid-city, right? Um, and how fortunate was it for you guys to be able to expand in your current location? Um, but but bigger point, bigger point, I will say this. Your fingerprints are all throughout Baton Rouge. I went to City Roots this morning, not to mention another coffee shop while La Divina sponsors me. But I went to City Roots this morning and got some tea that you guys sell. And the reason I know that you guys sell it is because I bought it from you guys. And then when I got it from City Roots, I was like, where do you guys get this from? And they're like, from Red Stick Spice. Um, Or at least that's where they told me I could get it from, which I already knew. Um, And then I'm just so – I like the fact that there's a tea sommelier, Anne, because when I walked in – Um, I don't remember the name of the employee that helped me, but I was so intimidated by the different tea options you guys had because it's it's a little overwhelming, right? There's three different racks of all these different types of teas, and we just had a conversation. It was unpretentious. It was unpushy. She's like, you could try this. You could try this. She asked me all the right questions. Uh, She even did a blend for me, which was great. We talked about temperature and steeping. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, In our remaining time, Anne, you guys do more than just tea. You guys Mm -hmm. do spices, too. You do olive oil, uh, um, uh, balsamic vinegars, pretty much anything you need for the kitchen, right, in terms of spice and and, and essentials. Exactly, yes. So we are, you know, you can buy all your spices in bulk, single-ingredient spices, but kind of the the little heartbeat of the store is the middle of the store where the blends are. That's where we solve problems. That's where... When someone comes in and says, not boneless, skinless chicken breast again, not, you know, uh, grilled fish again, that's where we solve problems. That's where we make Taco Tuesday more interesting. That's right. where the home cook can um, try a curry, a curry that maybe they have a recipe that has 16 different spices in it. We can take them to a curry blend, right. and then suddenly they're making curry, which is one of the simplest dishes on earth. It's simple and complex at once. And so that's where conversations typically begin and then folks get the bottom line is we want people cooking at home more often um it's what we do it's what we believe in and once we get them comfortable there then they start to branch out into all these single ingredient spices and these chilies from all over the world um so yeah we're just here for the home cook i witnessed it myself i witnessed you helping um a a nice lady i was waiting for some tea and y'all were having a conversation about chicken and taking yeah. chicken to the next level. That was the phrase that I think came out of your mouth. Taking chicken to the next level. 
whole and I thought it was amazing. And look, we have about a minute left. I want to throw this out there too for for the listeners. I am developing a kitchen right now where I want to get into spices. I talked to some of your employees yesterday and I said, is there like a way of getting a starter kit together? And sure enough, they were like, uh, yeah, we can do that for you. And they pulled out this box full of different containers and they're like, we, we do something to where we will fill it up with different containers. Uh, and each container will have, a, you know, its own spice in it. And then you also sell additional containers. So if you're looking to get your feet wet in spices and you're not really a spice person, Definitely go to Red Stick Spice. They will help you out. They'll walk you through it. And like Ann said, they'll also help you strategically plan cooking options to take, Ann's words, not mine, your food to the next level. And thank you so much for joining us. And if they want to get in touch uh, with you guys, what's a good website for you? Uh, RedStickSpice.com. We're on all the social media, Red Stick Spice. And, um, yeah, we're at 660 Jefferson in Mid-City. Come see us. Well, and you'll certainly be a guest on the show again, or we'll get one of your T folk on here. Thank you so much for joining us. This was awesome. Thanks, Ron. No problem, man. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Man, I'm in that tea life. I'm in that tea life. You know who else? You know, Tommy Talley's going to come in the second segment, Brian, but i got to tell you, I think Tommy deep down inside likes that tea life too. I, I have ventured into his Airbnbs before, and there's always tea in the in the in the Airbnbs. I'm just throwing that out there. He may be a tea, he may be a tea guy too. And and by the way, we can't gloss over tea sommelier. That's a new life goal for me. Tea sommelier. Man, I need to get a hobby. I need to get a good hobby. Brian, who do we have up next? We have Marley Pittman. Hey, Marley, what's going on? Hi, Brian. Everything's going well on my end. How are y'all? Uh, I'm doing good in particular because I'm talking to a Baton Rouge celebrity right now. Marley Pittman, <laughs> Mid-City Redevelopment, kind of a big deal. You were just featured in 225 Magazine. I think you were on the news just now. I mean, I'm I'm frankly surprised that I was able to get you on the radio. Well, I was happy to uh, <laughs> squeeze you in. You've always been a great, uh, big supporter of Mid-City, well, so I'll, we're we're happy to be here. All, all joking aside, Guys, if you're listening, I literally texted Marley this morning at the butt crack of dawn saying, God, please, can you be on the show today? I had a cancellation, and Marley graciously agreed to be on. So, Marley, I want to talk about Key Academy and this new beautiful mural that went up. What can you tell us? It's Yeah, it's a beautiful new piece. It's the largest mural, largest contiguous mural on Government Street in Mid-City, so we're very excited about it. It was a fun project. We worked with Louisiana Key Academy, which is a school for students with dyslexia. Um, and it's this really kind of model institution for developing like best learning practices for teaching reading to, to students who experience dyslexia, which is, uh, you know, which leads to a difficulty of being able to like recognize letters. If maybe some of your listeners aren't familiar and we work with them and Catholic high and some local area businesses to all sponsor this big mural by a local artist, uh, Taylor Jacobson with the urban canvas studio. So how did this? So all, it's been a fun project. How did this all come together? Like, how does a mural? This is the question I really want to want to know because I've I've done a little bit of work with different mural entities. I don't want to name drop Wallace Project. Um, <laughs> how does it happen that somebody decides, hey, I want a mural, and then how does a mural it just end up on a on a wall? That is a great question. I think uh, people are really intimidated by community improvement or creative placemaking. You know, it's kind of the buzzword, uh, the creative placemaking yes. projects. And it's actually quite simple. So I drive government, I live off government street and I work off government street right. and I drink off government street. And um, so I was just, just kind of driving to work one day and I looked at this gorgeous big blank canvas of a building. They just remodeled it. Um, you know, it's the old Piccadilly building. And I was like, oh, gorgeous place for a mural. Got to be able to do that. So then you, <laughs> so then, you know, the biggest challenge is usually money uh, right. and approval from, you know, whoever owns that building, if it's a private building or if it's city property, approval from the city. So first you go to the powers that be, you know, who owns the building, who's currently leasing it, and you talk to them about it. You get them to agree generally to the concept. Then right. you go around and you try and find the money. We're very lucky in Mid-City, so White Light Night, which is, you know, our big art hop that everybody loves to come to. It's actually a fundraiser for public art, so we have a little bit of money that I can pull from to do it. And then we we did a call to artists. We get the art approved, and then the the painter just does it. So I don't think... It's actually quite simple. I don't think people 
you, you make it sound simple, by the way. And she, by the way, very humbly, she told me this morning, Brian, you know, out of all the projects I do, this is actually one of the easy ones. And I'm like sitting there thinking to myself, man, getting a mural, no big deal. <laughs> Just no big deal. <laughs> People don't understand. It, it is easy. So, so or It's easier than some. It's so than some. I was going to sponsor a mural for the Baton Rouge Public Defender's Office. They're in the governmental oh, building wow. on the seventh floor. And I did not realize how, not to be tacky, these things are not cheap. They're no. expensive, right? The, it's it's If you think about it, it's a big, giant piece of art on the side of something, and it's massive, and, and like, I priced it, and I was just like, I don't think I can donate that much. So, so yeah, art is, I mean, you have to pay your artists. I mean, so yeah. we want a thriving art community in Baton Rouge. you got to find jobs that can pay artists. You know, that's, you know, keep their bills paid so they keep putting out art. Um, and then you got to find ways to showcase that. I mean, so that's an incredible project, but no, it is not cheap. So, if you can find an artist who really believes in the project, they might be willing to kind of work with you a little bit. Um, but I'll tell you what, exposure does not pay their bills. So I was just about to say, and I'm excited that we have Tommy Talley coming in second half because artists and lawyers have something very in common, very much in mm, common. You this, don't hear that every day. This phrase of, hey, why don't you just do this for no charge because it'll help your exposure. And I'm like... <laughs> Helping my exposure don't pay no bills, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, oh, man. And so I when art, I hear an artist, and I consider Tommy an artist. I consider a mural. Yeah, I do. Uh, I, consider, I consider chef artists. Yeah. I, mean, I think one thing that's beautiful about Louisiana's culture as opposed to other ones is we have a really big understanding of what art is. And it's food, and it's music, and it's graphic design, and it's, you know, traditional fine art. It's all of those things. So changing gears a little bit, um, you're at the Mid City Redevelopment, right? Yep. So my I'm the director of community relations at Mid City Redevelopment, and I sit on the board of directors for Mid City Merchants and Mid City Girl. What is the mission of that entity? What do you guys do? Yeah. So we are an affordable housing organization and a neighborhood revitalization group first and foremost. So we build affordable homes for families. Um, we rehab homes, we prevent foreclosure, we have homeownership education, and then we work a lot with civic associations providing direct training to residents and dollars for community improvement projects that they identify, that they carry out. Um, so, you know, some pretty famous projects, I would say, for some of our, some of our work is like the Pocket Park in Capitol Heights. Right. Um, their complete redo of the Longwood Court Homeowners Association on Government Street. So. We do a lot of that kind of work, um, and it's really meaningful for trying to keep the area affordable, but also growing and moving I, and changing. I was just about to ask, did you use, use the, the phrase affordable housing in the same conversation as Capitol Heights? Because, yeah, so our, <laughs> because I have so questions. We are not the only ones building homes <laughs> right, in this city. <laughs> right. So what we believe in, um, you know, this kind of brings into the whole gentrification conversation, right? Right. So That's kind of where I was going. I didn't want to ambush no, you. Ahead. We can talk the hot button issues. I don't care. Yeah. So gentrification, we're actually trying to parse that out. So there is absolutely nothing wrong with new people coming into a community. Right. That, and that they're bringing their ideas and their energy and their money for, for local businesses or whatever. That's all fine. The problem is displacement. So it's about right. making sure that there are some spaces that maintain affordability so you have a mixed income. That's where community development kind of best practices are moving. Mm. You don't want an entirely poor neighborhood, and you don't want an entirely rich one. That doesn't help anybody, right? right. You want to have places that are affordable so artists can live there or people, you know, you can secure and prevent foreclosure so that people aren't kicked out of their neighborhood where they've lived their whole lives, and they can keep that history alive and well. So. It's about it's a delicate balance, really. Uh, no. Whenever you're talking about community development, but we um, the homes we build, we sell to low to moderate income families, and they must maintain affordability for 15 years. So I I will tell you, I appreciate what you guys are doing, um, Mid City. Uh, as I said in the first segment, I have a special place in my heart for Mid City. It's where I live. It's where I like to play. Um, my favorite businesses in Baton Rouge are are mostly located in that in that corridor. Um, and keeping it, I'm going to use the word pure in the sense of, of keeping it kind of with the same atmosphere that it has that I've come to love. I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Um, and I thank you guys for doing what you've been doing. Uh, 
both making Baton Rouge beautiful as well as making it to where people can and actually enjoy the beauty by being able to be in a place that is on fire right now. So, well, thank you, Franz. So, you know, I will say next year is a 30 year anniversary of this project we call Mid City. Right. You know, in 1991, a bunch of people, this wasn't named that, there was no name for this kind of semi urban region between downtown and suburban Baton Rouge. A bunch of people just sat down and said, let's name it. Let's create some organizations to work on it, and then let's fund that work. And, and so it has been a wild ride for people so, who have been doing this for the past 30 years, uh, but it has been really meaningful to see the change. And so a we, lot of this really come to fruition in the last five years. So we got a, we got a parade now. We've got, we've got a festival <laughs> right. that almost happened but may happen in the future. Um, That's right. <laughs> and, we've got, and we've got Marley Pittman from Mid-City Redevelopment. Thank you so much for being on the show. Next time I'll give you a little bit more notice before I, I, I get you on, okay? <laughs> That's okay. I'm happy to talk about this anytime. All right. Thank you so much, Marley. All right. How much time we got? Okay. We're going to go to a quick break. Brian tells me we're going to go to break. When we come back, we're going to talk sliders and how many sliders can Franz Borkart eat? 20. And we're going to have the talented, the awesome Tommy Talley on. So we're going to take a break. I'm going to run to the little boys room. We'll be back. Yeah, you feel insecure? You feel secure about that? I do. Do you feel in charge? I roll up here at 4.30 in the morning feeling super secure. Um, yeah, we were just about to flip to the next call, to the next interview, or else it could have come down right away. Not a problem at all. But, yes, the last person in is supposed to pull it back or... Yank it shut. Double, Got it. double check. Copy that. How have you been, man? Oh, I've been good. To have the kids back at school? Very, very much so, because uh, my schedule is just nuts right now. Yeah. My schedule and Chuck P's schedule are roughly the same. Yeah. Chuck P always sounds tired, but when I heard him on 98.1 last night, I was like, this man's art, like, sleep. He's, he's asleep. Like, he, he got him. Yeah. So we're talking about whatever you want to talk about, by the way. Yeah. Airbnbs, filmmaking. Yeah. Shitty COVID life. Mid city. Mid city. Did we pluck this guy off of here? Or? You don't need it. Okay. You don't need it. I'm not going to use it. Yeah, okay. Because um, you're in person, man. Gotcha, gotcha. So when I tell you I spend an exorbitant amount of time and money at Red Stick Spice and La Divina yeah. buying teas, hot teas. Yeah. yeah. So I'm supposed to replace bad habits in my life with good habits, mm-hmm. and hot tea is one of those where I, you know. It's a good one, too, because it's got so many ways to go, right? Right. Which I am not that educated on, but. There's apparently tea sommeliers. Mm-hmm. How about that? Yeah. Brian, you weren't very impressed with the tea cut sommelier thing. You seem you seem underwhelmed by that. I just got to warm it up every day. You're never going to drink hot tea? I never thought I was going to drink hot tea. Probably not. No, I'm probably not going to find another way to spend like $8 a day on something. Gotcha. It's not that expensive, man. It's not. It's cheaper than coffee in the long run. Yeah. Man, he's you already, can receive it. He's already with the program. He's already got. He's already got the cash. The cash layout down. Dude, it's funny. Dude, I actually sat and in, in calculate. Cal- By myself on purpose, by the way. So. Okay. I didn't want to. Or redevelopment, or gentrification. Gotcha. Okay, that's all you had to tell me. I didn't know. Sorry. We'll talk later. (laughs) So moved into the new house. Um, I'm renting this week. Um, I've got one load of stuff left in my car from the office now. Everything else is set up. I did it. I did it the way of the smart way, which is I was putting things away as I moved it, which took a little bit longer to get the stuff over there. But, um, like I've got the dining room table now I've got, dude, I, I, I am so happy. Not that I don't love you, your Airbnbs. I'm so happy oh, just to take home. a deep breath yeah. and, and be like looking to the left of me and the right of me. It's like, Oh, this will be home for the foreseeable future. Yeah, dude. So, yeah, I, uh, we've done the move three, Twice, so 
we bought in Hundred Oaks, and then we. Uh, I'm yeah. not gonna. I'm not gonna say on the air where you live. Yeah. But I got. I told Brian before you got in here, that little pocket. Yeah. And I call it a pocket because I don't know who your neighbor to the left is. Right. But that area, I'm like, this dude has figured it out. This is, and I love a hundred oaks. Yeah. I grew up. In right. fact, I grew up on um, near the lakes on Cottonwood and Dogwood. Yeah. We would walk to Bedar. We would walk to Cottonwood Books. But that little pocket, man. Whoo. Yeah. Whew. Great little neighborhood. Yeah. When I saw it, I was mind blown. I mean, when we when we walked up on that house, the lady was like, "Everyone views it as a teardown. This is what's yeah. going on." And we walked in, we're like, "It's perfect." Did so, you have to put a lot of work into it, or we didn't put anything into that's it? Good for you, man. Good yeah. for you. The pool's nice too, by the way. Uh, yeah. So I would say that the <laughs> pool house we did put a few bucks into. We removed some walls. We made it a better Airbnb space. We'll, than, we'll talk about that on the. Uh, yeah. yeah. Without talking about. It. Yeah. Let's roll. Let's roll with it. I got to do an. Ready. I got to do an intro, Promo and then otherwise, yeah. yeah. Just point to me when I'm when you want me to pull my. All right, welcome back to the second half of the Go Rouge Show, episode 41. This half, we've got Tommy Talley and Burger Sliders to talk about. Before we jump into that, this is Franz Borkart along with Brian Haldane. Brian? Brian? You doing okay? I'm golden, man. Are you ready to watch me eat 20 sliders? I'm ready to watch you attempt to eat 20 sliders, correct. Uh, Attempt. Your, Your lack of faith gives me focus. No, I've talk- got great faith in uh, the sliders from Smalls. So we're going to try to do a charity component of this, guys. And uh, I think there's an actual bonus if I get sick on the air, um, which m- may happen. Although I cheated on my diet pretty heavily this last weekend. Um, I had City uh, Slice. I had China One over off of uh, of government in Mid-City. And I had uh, a good old-fashioned Louis double sausage biscuit with hash browns. So... Saturday was a cheat. Saturday was an expand your stomach cheat day. I'm mentally, I'm mentally ready for these twenty sliders. So, before we get into it, let's thank our show sponsors. We have the Smith Shanklin Sosa Personal Injury Law Firm. They're your go to personal injury firm. They don't stand on billboards. They just get stuff done. We got Breck Parks Sullivan Steakhouse, your neighborhood steak restaurant. The Borkhart Law Firm, bunch of Bunch of just fantastic criminal defense attorneys over there. I hear that Franz Borkart, he's good. Um, we have the Louisiana Tech Park and La Divina Italian Cafe serving select wines, ice, cold beer, plus their exclusive sorbet, 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 sorbet mimosas. I've never had it. I've seen it. It looks delicious. All right, without further ado, Tommy, what's going on, brother? Not that much, man. How are you? I'm just living the dream. And I'll tell you, it's not just because I'm drinking lots of tea, even though Brian Haldane hates on tea. Um, I wanted to get you on the show because, one, you're a storyteller. You identify yourself as a storyteller. And believe it or not, what I do for a living, um, not just to go rouge stuff, but as a lawyer, I tell stories for a living. Sure. Um, nobody views it that way, but that's, I mean, when you go to seminars and training, that's kind of what we do. And then also, you're in the Airbnb world, and I want to chat with you about that world, um, You know, not because... In the first segment, Marley was talking about justification and capital sure. heights, but more so because the Airbnb world has has been on a roller coaster. Um, I, although I would imagine that COVID stopped some of the pushback, mm-hmm. but probably affected your 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 business. So we can start wherever you want, For brother. Sure. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about storytelling, I mean, I'm a documentary documentary style film, right? Tell you know, story storyteller by trade, uh, reality TV, then documentary. Definitely not scripted. Definitely right. not a writer in that way. I like meeting people, following them, and trying to tell their stories and you, as possibly as possible. And you've done this in L.A. I mean, it's yeah. not just a local yeah. thing. So For sure. Uh, but, yeah, Airbnb became an extension for my wife and I to have something to do uh, to build our real estate portfolio. Um, and basically, we, we like creating. So right. we create a space, and when people visit our city, they get to experience through our lens, and we love that. And we've met plenty of people. Um, that way we have friend, now friends who've moved here after staying, being a traveling nurse for three months, staying on our property. And now they live in Baton Rouge and call Baton Rouge right. home. And so there's just a portion of that, that we, we just really love, you know, like this weekend we spent going to look out in St. Francisville at, uh, 
potential an, an old house yeah, uh, just yeah super fascinated so i think there's taking something old making it new or ish refresh whatever right. and then getting letting people stay there and experience your city that way is fascinating so the the thing i liked as as listeners may not know i've been a guest of tommy's airbnbs before for various reasons we won't necessarily go into um but the thing i liked about your airbnbs is that you can take space and make it into something unique it is kind of like a canvas right um i also was very intrigued at some of the the i don't want to use the word rigging but but some of the design of ways you were utilizing space, which I've now incorporated into my life, because I was like, I'd look at something, and it's like maybe the way you had a power strip or maybe a, a way you did something, and I was like, that's really smart. That makes perfect sense that he's doing that. So um, the furniture all had looked like it had a story behind it. Sure. Um, so I want to back up a little bit because I don't know when it was, and, and I'm, I'm taking my lawyer hat and my Go Rouge hat and, and playing with them here. Um, there was a movement for a while to kind of put the kibosh on Airbnbs. And, and like I said, it seems like because of COVID or for other reasons, everybody's kind of not talking about it anymore. Yeah. Um, give us a little background, if you will, sure. about, and, and then look, we can approach it from a, there's the historical area background. And then there's the, Hey, just a, just a Airbnb in downtown Baton Rouge. Sure. So, yeah. So for us, I mean, watching the roller coaster that was Airbnb, which was, we get our first Airbnb, turn our pool house into it, pretty much time and a half, almost double what our normal rent to a college student would be. So we start to understand this math can change our family's future right. and the way the cash flow works. So we start to dabble in that space and look for more opportunities. I'm in Las Vegas probably six months later on a job talking at a blackjack table, and a guy hears that I'm talking to a lady about Airbnb. He's like, you own Airbnbs in New Orleans? I own 50 in New Orleans. And that for me was the beginning of this understanding. There are cities in this in the US that really can't allow Airbnb just to be unregulated. Right. And I'm an Airbnb guy and I support that. New Orleans has has, has got to have certain regulation. Hawaii has to have regulation. Manhattan, right. Boston, some of these places, it's just worth more than the average income would be to pay for it to tourists. And tourists will just destroy that market. Right. Um, so we've always kind of ridden that thing. Luckily for us, we live in Baton Rouge, and everyone looks at us and goes, you must not be making that much money. It must be this. And I guarantee you I'm not making how New Orleans shotguns were doing. If you owned a shotgun in New Orleans and, you know, it was like your, your two-bed duplex, you were crushing it for that level of investment 10 years ago. Mm. Um, nothing like that in Baton Rouge. But we have old loft apartments above Boudreaux and Thibodeau's that we're slowly taking and rescuing and bringing back to life. You know, we bought uh, an 1870s carriage house on Laurel, mm -hmm. we put $20,000 into that within the first year. So there is a historic fixing up version of it for sure. Um, and I know there's a lot of negative, but at least we see the positive and feel we can defend our story in that regard. So, so as someone who doesn't own Airbnbs, but as someone who's, I will say someone who lawyers occasionally and does constitutional law occasionally, um, the thing I struggle with, and I've had very heated philosophical discussions with historical preservation folks, is at the end of the day, yeah, we have zoning requirements, and yeah, historical properties need to be preserved and whatnot. But in the same breath, if you buy a property in Spanish Town, and you can make a good living Airbnb in that property, and by the way, you're also sharing an experience with someone who I may never buy a house in Spanish Town. I will probably never buy a, sp a house in yeah, Spanish Town. I. Yeah, I like I said earlier, I can't afford a Capitol Heights house right now. Yeah. You know, so if I can spend a weekend somewhere and have an experience and love my city a little bit differently, or if I can go to a city, I get it. I mean, so I I, I see both sides of the argument. I, I get a little pissy about about the ownership yeah. rights getting trampled on, but that's another conversation. I, I push back on the Spanish Town in the sense of Spanish Town complains a ton. They yep. toot their horn. There's a reason my wife and I never look in Spanish Town to acquire property to do it because Spanish Town doesn't want us there. We don't want to be there. Right. I've never met a neighborhood that loves themselves so much right. in that way. And it's just like, guys, I don't even have any Airbnbs who want that I know who want to be in Spanish Town. They want to be in mid city or downtown. Right. Right. Most of them honestly want to be in mid city right now with what's happening. Well, and and that that leads to my second point of conversation. So I was somebody who was not displaced by storm. I, I had some family issues going on, so that's why I stayed in Airbnb. Um, 
people use Airbnbs for different reasons, right? Correct. There's the the weekend warrior where I'm going. I want to go to Mid City for a weekend and just walk to to Mid City Beer Garden and experience all these places. Or I want to stay on Laurel Street and just walk around. By the way, the Laurel Street one, it's in the heat of it, man. I mean, you can go to the main uh, the, the Main Street Market. You can walk to to uh, to uh, right Kosha. around the corner. I walked man, co- to Kosha. How amazing is that? Um, I love it, that place. Yeah, I mean, it's it's wanting to be in the heat of it for a weekend. So what is your mix? Is, do you have more people basically long-term renting, short-term renting? What do you see? It's a pretty solid mix. And so you have COVID, which is a lot of short-term stuff originally. Like it's like, I need this, this. And so like sporadically, I was going week to week with folks. And um, I um, going week to week with folks. And um, then all of a sudden you have like the, the storm in like Charles, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like that changes everything. So, Historically speaking, we have a very balanced mix. We don't allow people to stay for shorter than two nights. Okay. Um, we keep that rolling. Um, and then we're really gunning for those seven to 14 day stays. Right. Like that's kind of our bread and butter. And that's someone coming in for um, extenuating, uh, what is it, like uh, LSU classes. They could be up in Shreveport, come down for mm-hmm. a week of classes, conferences when they're going off. So obviously, COVID changes all that. COVID did create a lot of scenarios. and friends, family members, roommates kind of splitting up, doing right. different things. And so my phone started ringing in a lot of interesting ways. And we did have a lot of, you know, hot and ready spots to go, if you will. Right. Come grab and go. And um, but, yeah, I think nurses and uh, weddings are normally where the money is that's, really at. That's awesome. Yeah. man. so I have to I have a wedding in February in New Orleans. And I got to tell you, as much as they're doing like a room block on a hotel, I've been really thinking about, man, I want to stay in an Airbnb for, for a mm-hmm. couple of nights. Yeah. Um, in COVID, and, and I say this prefacing this, and the, and the listeners know this, I, I'm a COVID survivor, Brian. I'll say that again, COVID survivor. COVID needs to bring kryptonite with this guy. Um, when I left the place I was staying in COVID, they had to do – like basically, even though the surface areas and Brian, I know you know the answer to this. The surface areas probably had the virus die over after a certain amount of time. They had an abatement crew come in and basically spray down stuff and, and do whatever you do, Lysol wise, which is probably an oversimplification of, of what it is. You guys having a lot of movement with your Airbnbs, what are you guys doing to kind of balance? I mean, because it's not like it used to be where you'd come in, you'd clean. Right. And you change the sheets, and you're good to go. Next, right. next one. You you got to do some stuff now. Yeah. How has that changed your your business model? It's well, it slows it down, and then we've charged more for cleaning fees. Uh, we've creeped up a little on them, but um, you know, we get a lot more questions from folks who are concerned. So we have seen more of that. Like a lady will be coming, like, "What do you do for this?" And it's like we clean thoroughly with Lysol and disinfectant. And mm-hmm. it's like there's really. You know, we don't have some special machine who comes in here and just like UV radiates the whole thing. (laughs) That's not how it works. So (laughs) thermodynamics, not so much. So um, but I think it's calmed down quite a bit. If anything, I get uncomfortable, like someone will have the Internet won't be working. And so I'll go to our three bedroom house and there's like kid playing PlayStation, kid watching movie, mom in there. And I'm like going to put my mask on and walk in and people are looking at you going, oh, you don't have to do that. And I'm like. I'm your Airbnb host. I'm wearing a mask into the house, you know? Right. But it's obviously still, I think a lot of people deal with that interaction, right? Like I walk in here today and I'm like, okay, do I sit there with the mask? Do I take the mask off? When do I take it off? Like, how does this all, the, what are the rules, man? So I, while I'm not wearing a mask right now, um, I have, I have been a major mask proponent and, and I, frankly, I get really impatient with folks that, that want to exercise what they believe to be civil rights by complaining. I'm not talking about people with medical issues. I'm talking about like, just, this is, this is their 1960s civil rights moment, not wearing a mask. And to compare that to taking a knee because of racial injustice, I don't have time for that. But that being said, um, it's interesting to me because as someone that stayed in the Airbnbs, I was just very cognizant of, you know, when when I was leaving, you know, whether it was yours or somebody else's, I would make sure that I would take any debris, anything. I mean, I wasn't messy, but right. but it was just I wanted to be that guy that was like doing my part to help out the situation. Um, all right, so Airbnbs, COVID life, you're still making some money, you're still doing well. 
Let's talk about documentary filmmaking. Okay. Are you still staying busy with that uh, based on what's going on? I mean, I'm just assuming there will be a COVID documentary at some point. Sure, sure. So <laughs> Tommy's TV was the original company I had created, and it was just pretty much me, uh, video production company. And now we are Echo Tango. Right. Uh, we market ourselves as Brand Plus Story. And so my business partner, Eric Martin, is a designer by trade. Um, and obviously me being behind the camera, we have a five-person shop at this point that is – acts more like agency, honestly. Right. I mean, we're building a big website for a company that makes pontoon boats. Okay, uh, cool. We, are, uh, we just did an Adidas commercial last year that got a lot of awards. Um, so we're in an even mix of it. I am talking to a family right now about a Title IX documentary, um, which is would be super interesting. Man, when you get into Title IX... I'm, I you, dabble. You, I dabble. You get... Like, everyone... At least I grew up with my dad complaining... I'm really upset that my f wrestling friends no longer get to, there's no wrestling scholarships at LSU anymore because of Title IX. Like, that was my understanding of what Title IX was. That is a very small fraction right. of what Title IX is. So, so when I, and, and when I say I dabble, so I focus in criminal law, mm -hmm. but one of the major areas of law I do in representing students is there's generally a Title IX component to a lot of the crimes that, that sexual assault and all that. And folks think it just, Folks, a lot of times when I say I do Title IX work, they think, oh, you mean like sports? And I'm like, mm, not so much. It's 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 the full gambit. Yeah. And then and then candidly, it is a, I call it the Wild Wild West because the rules and laws that surround it are nothing like a courtroom. And the rules of evidence are different. The rules of, of, of participation are different. Um the president gets to appoint someone who makes decisions and the colleges follow those directives. It's, it's like, seriously, and I'm not just saying this, I give talks to fraternities and sororities and we talk Title IX. Yeah. And they're like, they say, well, we don't play sports. What, what is, I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> so so you're, you're thinking about doing something with... So we have a... We're, we're, the group I'm working with is applying for a grant that's due this week. And so it's just early conversations. But as I've tried, they're seeking guidance for me on how to help frame the story. Um, and it's overwhelming because I don't even know where to begin. You know, this Darius Geis situation has a Title IX component, right? And so, like, all these multi layers. Again, I grew up with my dad being like, LSU had a great wrestling program. The guy I went to high school with was, the, was you know, a champion wrestler. And he was so mad that football had so many scholarships and that it was weird how it now broke down. And now you're exploring Title IX, and I'm like, that's what this is. This is so, so different. So the pendulum there, too, is what's also fascinating to me because I represent victims. Uh, STARS refers me a lot of uh, victims to, to help advocate for. And what's interesting to me is that pendulum effect of sometimes you have legitimate victims that just latently will report, hey, this bad thing happened to me. And they're being truthful. They're being honest. I, I don't have any reason to disbelieve them. And, and you know, the psychology behind reporting supports that sometimes you'd late report something or latently report something. And then on the other end, you, you've got the scenario where someone's accused of doing something and it's like you're scratching your head like, man, this is kind of weird. And then from a what it what is very interesting in my world, not that you want to talk criminal law, but what's really interesting is if there's a criminal charge, and a Title IX, there's also an academic component called accountability, and I'm using LSU as a model. So if you don't participate in accountability or Title IX, you can get expelled, right? If you participate, you can do something that can incriminate yourself over here in the criminal case. And by the way, there is no confidentiality in either of the Title IX or the accountability to where anything that's said over there can be handed, hashtag Max Groover, can be handed to the DA's office immediately. So navigating those waters both for the victim and for and, and by the way the victim's rights in title IX is different than the victim's rights of a crime um, a victim of a rape has certain statutory rights that they don't necessarily get in title IX, and it's like we all see it i think you're absolutely right we see it in the dairy darius geist model of up oh, he's a great football player now he's he's done now right i, mean, I don't know i don't know sports what, what's going on brian with darius guys he's done he's done done like no longer released from the Washington football program, and yeah, it, he's got a lot of charges in front of him. So. After and yeah, and after he got released, some chart, some reports came up from LSU from his playing days here. Okay, you know, and it, but it was a late, you can call it latent, latent reporting. Um, so, storytelling during COVID, 
Um, have you found that the stories have changed, or do you find that it's just? Yeah, no. I, uh, a lot of older entities have definitely thought to reframe their story through the phone now instead of think of a state agency where you have to get information out. People walk into the door mm. most of the time, or this is now us creating a 30 second, 90 second explainer video to teach people how to sign up for Snap, you know, online. Um, and so it, it, but they, that program never thought so, they really needed it. They, they knew they needed it, but there right. was no, nothing to push to get it done. So and, and all of a sudden when you can't walk into offices, when you're, everyone has to reinvent. So we did a lot of that stuff during COVID. Um, if I'm being excited about anything and it's not to delve into something you might not too much about, but I'm a huge gamer. Okay. And Twitch. I'm excited about Twitch. What is Twitch? Twitch is where gamers stream online and people watch them play games, which I never okay. thought in a million years people would enjoy because when I was a kid, I was going to fight you over the controller. I didn't so want to watch you. You literally just watch Brian playing a game. Correct. Um, and we can record Twitch from he you know, remotely. We can, we can work with gamers and their sponsors from Baton Rouge, Louisiana and create content for them. So I'll say this I occasionally will go down YouTube rabbit holes. And, like, Zelda is a good example. Mm -hmm. So I'll go down a rabbit hole because there's Zelda games I haven't played. And I'll just watch YouTube videos of, like, Link fighting a boss or something. And I'll geek out a little bit. Sure. Um, but, man, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about that as a, as a hobby ritual. Like, So the way I've been experiencing, you know, from the restaurant standpoint, going into a restaurant instead of looking at a menu, zooming mm -hmm. uh, or, or what do you call it when you use your camera to scan, <clears throat> scanning, uh, Q yeah. is a QZAN. I don't know. I'm Q, a lawyer. QR code. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that's a new, to me, I, in fact, when I was having you come on, I was thinking about, man, that's an interesting kind of, because I did it last night. I did it at Syrups, uh recently. I've done it at Umami where it's just, there's no, and the menu has part of the story to it, right? Yeah, so sure. Well, uh, from a technology perspective, QR codes have been around forever. Right. We didn't have readers built into our phones like that. You'd have to download a separate reader, and then people would never use them. So as a, from a design, from a company side, when, when you're helping a client, you'd almost never build them. Now that you just open your phone on the quick thing, and it automatically knows it's a QR code, and then, you know. It's on fire now, the huh? data. Yeah, it goes. So we got about two minutes left. If people want to connect with you and what you do, whether through the Airbnbs or through your, your, your documentary company, uh, Echo Tango, yeah, right? Echo Tango Creative. You can find us on the Google. Um, and uh, as far as Airbnb goes, the best way to find us is just going to Airbnb and checking for your dates. Uh, once you get there, you can find us. Uh, if you run into us, you can click on us and see our whole, whole portfolio. We have we just launched our tenth. Mm -hmm. um, again, we do not own all those. Right. Uh, we've been approached by uh, a gentleman who owns a lot of older properties, and there's a good balance there. We take them, put some money into them, fix them up, and then. You know, get them rolling. So I, I think I think I would be remiss if I didn't again emphasize that the style of your of your Airbnbs, I, it, it's 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 kind of like okay, so you're we're we're comparable ages, so there is that feel sometimes. Like one of the cool things they had, uh, Brian, was the gaming systems. Um, it made me a little nostalgic. To I mean, you're a gamer too, right? You were a gamer at some point, right? Uh, enough to be familiar with it, right? You had like an old school, you had a super and an in, in, in Nintendo 64. Yeah, so yeah. that that one unit was built out where that one bedroom is basically my high school bedroom. It's got a Bo Jackson poster on the wall, right? Right, Nintendo 64. We originally had a CRT in there, which eventually burned out, so I had to pull it out. And moving those things makes you want to never get another one because right. they're heavy. So, in our remaining time, first of all, Tommy, thank you for coming on. Thanks, um, I definitely, if you're looking for an Airbnb experience, uh, Tommy knows all about it. I would actually advocate. Um, if you're thinking about getting into the industry, uh, you know, you certainly would be somebody that I would want to talk to. All right. So we got a little bit of time left. Burgers next Friday, Tommy, Brian, I'm coming in Friday. I'm sitting down. I, I made a, I made a check out that my body may not be able to cash. Uh, I've made a comment that one sliders aren't real burgers and two that I could eat 10 burgers, no problem. And then that became 20. So now the, the, the question is, is can Franz Borkard eat 20 sliders from Smalls Sliders? Smalls is going to donate the sliders. Um, there's going to be a charity component. Um, uh, Jaron over from uh, NBC Fox has a little uh, GoFundMe page to help uh, Lake Charles uh, hurricane relief. So there will be a charity component. I think the betting, I haven't really talked to Brian about it, but I think it's going to be a betting for or against me doing it. This is such a stupid idea. 20 is a big number, man. This is such a stupid idea. 
There's nothing good that's going to come of this other than this. Well, helping the folks in Lake yeah. Charles will come yeah. of this. I will yeah. defile myself for a good cause. I'll be I'll honest. Just, I'm not a big eater. I I crushed through four of those at a, l- a lunch break on a set on set one day, and I I was a little shocked because they they are they aren't huge and they go down pretty easy. So, so so I talked to somebody that's my size, and he said I had three, and he was full afterwards, and I was like, oh no. Mm-hmm. So he the bet is most folks are saying six to ten, mm-hmm. right? I think you can get ten. Right. Yeah. Twenty is going to be you're gonna be hurting at ten. Twenty, okay. you're going to want to die. So forty five minute. Brian has imposed a time limit, mm-hmm. so I have to eat in forty five minutes too. Brian making rules. Yeah. You can't just sit there for the rest of your life. This though. isn't Nom. There are rules. <laughs> Great Lebowski. So, anyways, or Big Lebowski. All right, guys. Well, that's about it for this episode. Tommy, you're definitely going to come back, man. Look, normally we see you on Jay's show. You're on other shows too, right? I mean, really, just Jay and this? Yeah, I'm this. I'm like a diet version of Jay. I'm like a <laughs> like a tab version, retro tab. Anyways, that's about it for this episode of the Go Roos Show. Stick around uh, for next week. Um, I don't really know what's going to be on next week, but I'm sure we'll figure it out. And so again, Franz Borkart, Brian Halday, and y'all have a good week. So, 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 check this out. Tommy's Airbnbs had a wide assortment of teas. And that, I got to tell you, that was the, this sounds so asinine. The extra level for me was not just the coffee maker. Mm -hmm. It was the, huh, I could have tea if I wanted to. The mini fridge, I forget what the mini fridges had. I think, I think there was a beer in Laurel Street. And then there was something in the, in the pool house one. I didn't drink it because I'm not drinking these days, but it was like, I'm like, Ah. Yeah, so two Paradise Park in the fridge, two bottles of water, assortment of teas, granola bars, micro yep. popcorn. When you do all that, I think we're at about six dollars per guest if they if they consume everything, which right. a lot of times they don't. Right. Uh, if they're there for three, four, or five days, sure. But we find that just that few extra bucks goes a long way. It's the little things. Yeah. Um, uh, I enjoyed. I'll, I'll tell you this fun story, and then we'll, we'll cut out. Brian, um, when I was staying at Laurel Street, Tommy's mom was the, the the gardener, and there was some gardening, and that was right before I entered into my plant addiction. Um, it's a it's an addiction. It's I need help. Um, and I was watching your mom just like work all these plants, and I'm like, she looks so happy doing it. I don't know if she was in fact happy. Dude, that's so, her, she's fought guests who like stay a long time at Laurel who water the plants for her. She's like, I don't touch them. Man, I those don't. are my plants. I'm gonna water them. Like, I'm good. That's like her escape from. I don't, I don't, you know what? I I knew better. Anyways, y'all have a good one.